I'm going to tell you a story that is both a drama and a love story. It's the story of Juneteenth. I know, I know, I know. Stories about slavery are usually depressing, and if you're like me, they make you angry. But the story I'm going to tell you about Juneteenth highlights a humanity about Black folks often missed in historical narratives. From a husband loving a wife so much he returned to slavery just to be with her, to defying danger for freedom, and to turning an unwanted swamp into a prosperous city. Join me, Fami Redwood, in a very special episode of Beyond Black History Month: The Journey to Juneteenth. We begin in September of 1862, the middle of the Civil War. That's when President Abraham Lincoln issued the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. He said, "If the Confederacy didn't end the war and rejoin the Union by January, all enslaved people in those states would be freed." Well, the South didn't stop fighting, nor did the enslavers tell black folks the president gave them freedom. It's not like enslavers wanted to end the free labor that made them rich. In fact, Leon Litwack, the author of the book "Been in the Storm So Long: The Aftermath of Slavery," wrote that enslavers believed Texas would be a safe haven for them. He says, beginning in 1862, 150,000 enslaved people were brought into Texas from other states as a way of continuing slavery. So on. June nineteenth, eighteen sixty-five, years after slavery was supposed to have ended, Union General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas, one of the last vestiges of slavery, and delivered General Order Number Three. He ordered the freedom of at least two hundred fifty thousand enslaved folks in Texas. This began the celebration of Juneteenth. Mama, them didn't know where to go. You see, after freedom broke. That's the voice of a woman who was enslaved on a plantation about a hundred miles from Galveston. Her name is Laura Smalley. Miss Smalley was about ten when her, her family, and everyone else on the plantation were freed. You know, and old Marshall didn't tell you know it was free. He didn't tell you that. No, he didn't tell. They wait there. I think now they say they wait them six months out of that, six months, and turn them loose on the nineteenth of June. That's why you know you celebrate that day, colored folks. Celebrate that day. Formerly enslaved men and women celebrated not just their freedom, but the freedom of the children yet to be born. A realization that future generations would have lives they could only imagine, but imagine no more. But where do those newly freed people go? How do they start their new lives, and what dangers would they face? That news spreading from Galveston and moving upward from the coast of Texas. That's Zion Escobar. She's the executive director of the Houston Freedmen's Town Conservancy. She helps us understand the decisions the newly freed people faced. That news is traveling far and wide. As people hear the news, they're learning that they now are free. What do they do with that freedom? Where do you go? They were offered the option to stay put, but as 84-year-old Jacqueline Bostic points out, many of them wanted true freedom, not a taste of it. And she would know. Her great grandfather was Jack Yates, one of those newly freed men. They said that the people could only stay on those plantations if they were willing to continue to work. But they would not pay them. Is a difficult decision. Go into something you've never known, to places you've never been. After you've only known this life, you don't have the skills to read and write. You don't know where you're going to go. Zion says they wanted a place where they could do all the craftsmanship and all the artisan work they had been forced to do for their enslavers. Where can we now get paid for that expertise, for that labor? Where can we make a name for ourselves, a living for ourselves and our family? Where can we educate ourselves so that we can actually improve upon the next generation? The answer was in an area that would now be considered parts of Houston, but it was a dangerous trip. 
According to historians, a formerly enslaved woman named Susan Merritt described seeing newly freed black folks hanging from trees. Historians say they were caught trying to cross a Texas river to the freedom they were entitled to. You've been traveling by foot, trying not to be recaptured. You finally make it to this swampy, malaria-infested place mostly along the banks of Buffalo Bayou. There were no places here for them to stay. There were no institutions for them at that time. So they were allowed to stay down on an area near the Buffalo Bayou. They didn't have houses or homes at that time, so they had to deal with whatever the elements were, and they set up tents and things until they were able to, with the help of my great-grandfather, buy property and move further on up into the area. And, and then the story of Freedman's Town begins. After slavery ended, black towns popped up nationwide. Many were called variations of Freed Man's Town, like Freetown on Long Island in New York. But Freedman's Town, the one near Buffalo Bayou, became one of the larger black settlements in Texas. Some families came from Galveston, others from elsewhere. And as a person of color, you saying, I've done this before. We've cleared and we've, we've made a way and we've made a life out of absolutely nothing. It was an undesirable, flood-prone, marshy, malaria-infested place. And so the powers that be said, this is where you should make your life because I don't want it. <laughs> and so this is where Freedman's Town springs up, kind of out of the mud. You hear people talking about, I came from the mud, you know, I'm out the mud. Freedman's Town literally is from the mud and the banks of Buffalo Bayou, right? That's, that's its origin story. You're having Riverside revivals, right? And you're getting baptisms in that water of Buffalo Bayou. After a few years, the growing community was able to move inland and build homes. They'd been constructing homes and businesses for their enslavers for years. Now they could do it for themselves. Jacqueline Bostick McElroy. Jack Yates is her great great grandfather, and Miss Bostick is her mother. Growing up, I heard all the stories of Jack Yates. While many of the formerly enslaved were experienced builders, Yates was able to teach them more. Where he was raised gave him insight a lot of black folks at the time didn't have. When Yates was a baby, his enslaver's wife died in childbirth. Yates' mom was brought into the main house to take care of the now motherless son. That child was about the same age as Yates. And because they became friends with his mother raising him and the slave owner's son, he learned how to read and write because the, he and the boy were friends. And when the boy went to school, in the evenings he would have school with Jack and they would be away from the house and he would teach him and they would have school. So he learned what he wasn't supposed to learn and he wasn't selfish and he shared it with others as best he could to make sure that it would help them to become empowered. Yates was one of the town leaders. He helped the community grow into a self-sustaining city. But had he made a different decision years earlier, history may have been altered. Remember when I said earlier that white enslavers moved to Texas after the Emancipation Proclamation was announced? Well, listen to Jacqueline's favorite story about her great-great-grandfather. When he was in Virginia, when they announced Emancipation Proclamation, he was freed. My great-great-grandmother was on another plantation and her slave owner came to Texas because they still had slaves in Texas. And so Jack Yates went back into slavery to be with his wife and his family. And to me, that's the most incredible love story. He was just a man that truly believed in family. That love he had for his family, he had for his fellow people. He helped to develop schools. He helped to develop all kinds of businesses. He made sure that they knew and understood how to acquire and buy property and help them to buy it. Made sure that the taxes were paid, helped them to make sure that they kept their property. He was a man of Great vision. By the early 1900s, 94% of Freedman's Town was owned by residents. And by the 1930s, there were over 400 Black-owned businesses. And instead of tent revivals, Antioch Baptist Church was born. 
The church is our meeting place. We are educating ourselves in the churches. Antioch Baptist Church began its services on the banks of the bayou under a makeshift shelter. Yates worked as a drayman where he hauled goods, but on weekends he would read the Bible with others. So in 1868, he became the pastor of Antioch, but it needed a new home. So in 1875, he encouraged the church board to buy land and build a church, which still stands to this day. The brick Gothic Revival Church was built entirely by African Americans. They even made their own bricks. My great-great-grandfather had a strong faith. Jacqueline is a member of the same church her great-great-grandfather led. She says his faith built a foundation and gave his community hope. You know, yes, they came from enslavement, but there was so much more in store for them in being able to make their own decisions. That if they survive slavery, they can do so much more of their own volition, of their own choosing, and not be held back. He was a man that believed in God and believed in faith. And he also believed in education. You didn't have to be a genius, but you needed to know how to do just the plain things in order to be able to move forward and be able to contribute to your community. They're teaching people to read. They're helping to train people for a workforce. And so this is how your working class grows and you transition from laborers to agents of change, able to affect the economics of the community you're living in, everyone helping and shipping in because you have no one else. And so Freedman's Town kind of springs out of that energy of we must help each other because there's no one else here to help us and we know no one's coming. And so you buckle down. You say, what can we do to do better, to build better, to live better? You're improving the homes. You're learning how to construct these shotgun homes. And that, that person, by the way, is Jack Yates. He's helping to learn, um, help people learn how to build homes, how to grow lives, how to buy land, how to invest, which as we know today is the American dream. And so you have people teaching other people how to live up to the American dream, how to exercise their freedom. In addition to using the church as a school, Yates founded Houston College. That evolved into Texas Southern University. From the moment African Americans in Galveston found out they were free, Juneteenth remained an important celebration. On Juneteenth every year, they would have a parade in town, but then they would have to go to their homes or to their church in order to have any type of a celebration. And the idea of a park to specifically celebrate Juneteenth was born. My grandfather had been interested in this piece of land. He knew the man who owned it. And he thought that it would be a great place for the community to come together. So in 1872, Yates and three other formerly enslaved men raised $1,000 to purchase 10 acres of land. One of the major challenges was getting enough money together. But worth the struggle. They named the property Emancipation Park, their new home for Juneteenth celebrations. <laughs> Freedman's Town is a nationally registered historical site. Emancipation Park is still there and this year is celebrating its 150th year. And some streets lined with red bricks also remain. These bricks are significant because they were laid over 100 years ago when residents were sick of walking in mud. Historians say in the early 1900s, the town paid for their own bricks, laid it themselves, and in a West African pattern, showing a strength of the diaspora and a connectivity to African roots that survived slavery. Friedman's town carries a legacy, and Zion recently realized why she was pulled towards it. When the ancestors are talking to you, you listen. One day while doing research, the church historian brings a paper over to me. And that paper indicated Zion has a connection to the town. A man named Reverend Ned Pullum was a pastor and owned several businesses, including a brick company and pharmacies. The house he built in 1898 is still there. It looks like the McCoys that are somewhere related to my family tree were co-owners, business partners, co-investors, whatever that, that special relationship is, but they were partners with Ned Pullum in his pharmacy business. 
I'm continuing on that journey to, to get the receipts, to have all the evidence and compile that with a genealogist. But I invite people to actually jump on this journey as well. You don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to know what tribe in Africa you're from to know that you were from West Africa. Juneteenth was predominantly celebrated by Black folks in Texas and other Southern states. But in recent years, its importance began to spread and more families joined in. But Jacqueline says that's ironic because also in recent years, there's been a push to rewrite the darker moments of American history. But when those darker moments are acknowledged by a federal holiday, it's harder to avoid those conversations. We need to show others our contribution to history, but we also need to show our children where they come from, what they can do. She says the story of Juneteenth is American history. Miss Bostick says it highlights what can be accomplished when people come together. The people whose shoulders on which we stand were people who did not have the opportunities that we have today, but they had the ability to know and understand how to work together and how to help build the things that needed to be built. But they could only do that by learning to work together. And I hope that that is something that at some point I can see more of that every day in our communities. The legacy of Freedmanstown is greatness and resiliency. And because of that greatness, and because of the resiliency to endure, we now can look back at that story and connect to our greatness and find new resiliency as a people. Juneteenth means to me really freedom. It is a celebration of life, of possibilities, of determination, of strength. Whenever I see the pictures from the celebrations, it was a time period of pride and they celebrated their freedom and celebrated what they had in store for them. I try to imagine what those first moments would have been like on June 19th, 1865 standing outside in the hot Texas sun and learning that you're free. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. But admittedly, it's not anything I can truly imagine because it's an oppression I have the privilege of not knowing. But I am able to recognize the hope those who were formerly enslaved left us with, a reminder of who we are and what we can do. Thanks so much for listening to this special episode of Beyond Black History Month, Juneteenth, celebrating the past while affirming a joyful future. Next week, there will be more, so be sure to subscribe to Beyond Black History Month on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts from. This episode of Beyond Black History Month is a special production of 1010 Wins, WCBS News Radio 880, and 94.7 The Block. Special thanks to producers Dempsey Pillott, Jill Webb, and Andy Egan Thorpe, who is also the sound engineer. Skip Dillard is the Block brand manager. Tim Schaud is the WCBS News Radio brand manager. Ben Meverack is the 1010 Winds brand manager. And I'm Femi Redwood. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.